Episode 2 begins by rewinding time back to the moment just prior to the explosion. The camera shifts to the other side of the door, we get a brief glimpse of the melodious day-to-day -day existence of Chase, the owner of the apartment, hanging out with his best friend Caitlin, before the inciting incident of the story blows in his face, and his life is changed forever. From here on, the narrative structure of Arcane splits roughly into two plot lines, the Undercity plotline and the Piltover plotline, the two primary protagonists being Vi and Chase respectively. The two stories are closely connected, obviously, but for the length of episodes 2 and 3, they don't really cross. In fact, you could cut up these episodes and rearrange all the scenes from either plotline back to back, and no information would be missed from the other. So far, I've been breaking this show down chronologically scene by scene, but for the sake of cohesion and focus, I'm going to switch up the approach and talk about each plotline individually till the end of episode 3, starting with the story of Chase. Now fundamentally, this shifting of spotlight is a neat narrative device, showing this major event literally from a different perspective, and then following the repercussions of the event from that perspective, it effectively underlines the fact that the protagonist's actions do have consequences. The kids did rob a real person with a life of his own, the world, the events on screen, and the people amidst all of it do not exist in a void. It adds to the realism and bolsters the overarching ideals of the show. There is always another side to the story, literally on the other side of the door in this case. Actions have consequences, cause and effect. This simple burglary puts in motion a major chain of events that will end up moving the entire city into a brand new era. It's not the effect the kids were going for, but that is the eventual outcome. Another notable narrative device comes in the form of every author's best friend, the flashback. Chase gets knocked out by the explosion and the scene swishes to his childhood. And this is a super tiny detail, but I appreciate the fact that the transition between the present and the past has a clear bridge. What I mean by that is that the visuals and the situation of the two scenes meld together, so that the flashback doesn't just come out of nowhere. The blurring of Chase's vision mirrors the blinding blizzard, and then there's the thematic trigger for the flashback. The near-death experiences Chase has had both in past and present. Not that flashbacks absolutely need this kind of connecting element, but it's always nice to have something that sparks the transition, be that a significant object, a nostalgic location, a line of dialogue that makes the character reminisce, something like that. It's that tiny difference between functional and noteworthy directing. Together with the cold opening of episode 1, this flashback sets up a pattern for the rest of the series. Every episode of Arcane, excluding the season finale, starts out by exploring the past of one of the characters. It's a quick, clean and effective idea. Short scene, simple question, what makes the character tick, asked and answered in a minute or two each. Efficient storytelling. So years ago, when Chase was just a wee lad, he and his mother were out one day, strolling through a snowstorm. As one does, they are lost, their strength waning, all seems lost, when suddenly, they come across a mysterious stranger, the man busts out some epic level sorcery, teleporting the lot to safety. For all intents and purposes, Chase has witnessed a miracle. Both he and his mother were saved from certain doom by arcane arts. Moved and inspired by the man's kindness, Chase dedicates his life into researching the mystical, to find a way to integrate the power of magic with technology. He has witnessed the potential of arcane firsthand, and now he wishes to bring similar miracles into the lives of common people. This one act of compassion has created a man with a noble heart, with only one desire, seeking a better future for everyone. Good deeds resonate with the world, cultivating more good deeds. That's beautiful. Obviously, good intentions don't mean much when you skirt the law, especially when you have nothing to show for it for the time being. 
Jace's experiments with volatile materials are strictly forbidden, and he gets thrown in jail. While waiting for his trial, Jace gets a surprise visitor in the form of an old acquaintance. Fun little subversion there. For a fleeting moment you expect something more ominous. And then it's just this tiny funny looking fluffy gentleman. Imprisonment. What a curious principle. We can find the physical body, yet the mind is still free. I do love a good conundrum. One of the most consistent praises I can give this show is how it nails character introductions. Every new major actor entering the stage makes a memorable first impression, both in presence and personality. I remember the first time I saw you at the Academy. You reminded me of myself, a scientist, ready to forge a new vector of experimentation. But sometimes, we venture too far. No great science should ever put lives in danger. Immediately, Heimerdinger comes off as a sagely individual. Wise, experienced, compassionate, he carries himself with dignity and firmness, yet balances it out with a bit of bouncy quirky spirit, making him easily approachable. Heimerdinger inquires what exactly Chase was tinkering with, and once the subject of magic comes up, Heimerdinger immediately shoots him down and implores Chase to keep the details secret. Magic is seemingly a big taboo in Piltover, due to its chaotic nature. He is not to mention anything about the arcane to anyone. If Chase plays along and just offers a generic, sorry my bad, Heimerdinger promises that he will get off easy and all of this mess will soon be history. Interestingly, the good professor is part of the tribunal to decide Chase's fate. I'm not fully on board with the ethics of one of the judges to have a prep session with the defendant prior to the trial, but I do understand the motivation behind it. It's an act of respect from Heimerdinger towards his old student, although Heimerdinger is intensely against even the mere suggestion of researching magic. At the same time he doesn't wish to see Chase and his talents going to waste by rotting in prison for what he views as a minor youthful mistake. Arcane as a show is a prime example of a character centric tale. I don't think anyone would challenge that assertion. More important than any of the events happening on screen, the nitty gritty details of the plot, is always the cast of characters in the midst of things their ideals, their words, their souls. The plot does not happen to the characters, the characters actively make the plot happen with their decisions. This is personally my favorite kind of storycraft, whenever the author presents a collection of characters, fully fleshed out, with clear motives, interesting personalities, driving the narrative, I'm all up for it. I'm even willing to forgive the occasional hole in the narrative or dumb moment if I enjoy my time with the characters. Note that I said forgive, not ignore. And as always, a massive thanks to each of you for sticking around for this long. And a special thanks to all the supporters on Patreon, as well as an extra special thanks to my 10 euro supporters, Wyland, Jesaja Vanderwatt, Six Stars, Danny Kicks, and Clark Daniel Ivory. If you would like to join these fine people, or check out any of my other creative stuff, all the links are down below. Take care everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one.